Okay, our next speaker will be in Cody Teodoro, rubbing the Milky Way winter wind at age one. So yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> So, in this conference, we haven't been talking much about H1 emission. So, I'd like to, to show you how we can use the 21 centimeters and meter line to observe outflows in galaxies, in particular in, uh, in our own galaxy, the Milky Way. So, you already know everything about the Fabi bubble, so I'll just dive in, in, into uh, H1 stuff. So, if you take your other telescope and you point it uh, in the direction of the galactic center, you get something like this. So, uh, this is a column density map uh, of the direction of the galactic center, which is just here. And uh, so, this is basically the integrated emission of the uniform line across the uh, line of sight. And as you can see, there is a lot of emission uh, around latitude zero, and you can get it the disk. But then there is a lot of emission also at the latitude, and this is still the disk, but this is the, the disk uh, emission coming from uh, a solar neighborhood. So that's why we see it's uh, kind of latitude. Anyway, H1 comes also with the climatic information, which means that uh, you don't measure just the intensity, you also measure the velocity for each, uh, let's say, gas particle. And uh, this allows us quite easily to, um, to basically disentangle the stuff which is in the foreground from the stuff that is for real in the galactic center, because we know pretty well the spatial kinematics of the galaxy. So, for example, a couple of years ago, I want to know what happens when you change. A couple of years ago, Guru uh, Griffith and um, Lockman produced this map. This map of the galactic center. So, this is H1, which is the galactic center, okay? They basically removed all the foreground emission, and they found that there is a quite a big hole in the, in the center. It's about five kiloparts wide. And this is not completely unusual in the sense that many star-forming galaxies show uh, holes in the H1 distribution in the center. But what is interesting is that this hole is consistent with the presence of the Fermi bubble, which is here in red, and uh, also that uh, the H1 emission anticorrelates with the gamma ray emission. So, for example, if you look at this plot over here, this is basically a cut at a given latitude. So you have the emission on the y-axis and the longitude here. And uh, uh, you see the black one is the H1 emission, which drops off here. And in correspondence of this, the gamma ray just uh, breaks. So it seems that these two phenomena, the hole and the uh, gamma ray emission, are related somehow. However, it's difficult to say whether it's the wind that has blown up all the, all the H1 disk, or if the wind is just uh, expanding in a greater projectility, and this can happen because uh, the wind has a bar, and the, the effect of a bar is uh, pulling out gas from the galactic center. Probably it's a mixture of the, of the two phenomena. However, it's interesting also to, to, to investigate if there is any leftover of the process of blowing uh, gas away from the galactic center. So look for H1 clouds in this region here. And the first attempt in this direction was made a few years ago by Nathaniel Griffith et al. So they use compact array data. Compact array is in front in Australia. And they observe the inner five uh, degrees in longitude and latitude. And what they see is that there is a population of anomalous clouds. Uh, anomalous clouds, yes, with the kinematics is not compatible with being just a normal rotation, but they are instead consistent with being material moving with a velocity, radial velocity of about 200 kilometers per second. However, this study is not conclusive, it's not very robust, first of all, because these observations have very bad sensitivity, so it's possible that we are just seeing the tip of the iceberg on this population. And uh, moreover, we are at very low latitude, and, and at this latitude, uh, there are still a lot of uh, non circular motion that can account for many of these uh, anomalous features. So, uh, we decided to carry out a new survey at higher latitude, and we decided to use the 100 meter dish of the Green Bank Telescope, this beautiful antenna here. And uh, in radiant astronomy, size means high sensitivity. And we decided to observe these two strips 
so between 4 and 10 degrees in latitude for the old survey. And that is because we basically expected that the conical wind will expand in this direction here. And just as a reference, 10 degrees is about 1.5 kBc from the Arctic plane. So we are still at the very base of the of the boundaries. And I'm not going to go technical here. I just want to show you a couple of features of the new survey compared to the compact array survey using the previous study and the H145, which is the old sky survey uh, in H1, the rest we have today. So we go very deep in sensitivity, about a factor two better than gas and order of magnitude better than the compact array. We have a stereo spatial resolution, about twice better than gas, and even uh, more important is that we cover a very uh, wide spectral range. We have velocities between minus and plus 650 kilometers per second, which means that we can intuitively detect very high uh, velocity stuff. Okay, so our, our goal is to detect and study clouds uh, above and below the Atlantic plane, and uh, we do expect that these clouds are not in the disk. So the first thing we want to do is just to get rid of the Milky Way emission, because it's, it's yeah, bother us. So uh, we decided to do that by using a kinematic model of the disk. So I don't want to spend much words on that, I'm just going to show you an example of what I'm talking about. So these are two channel maps of the H1 emission, which means there are snapshots of the gas emission taken at velocity of minus 130 km per second, so gas moving in our direction, and 200 km per second going away. So if you do your model of the Milky Way, you have something like this. So everything is inside these green contours, basically it's gas normally rotating in the galaxy, the one a bit of mirror. But you can see we detected a really bunch of other clouds that are just not rotating with uh, the galaxy. And this is what we are looking for. And so what we did, we took our data, we removed the galactic emission, and we ran a source finder for identifying this kind of uh, cloud. And we found quite a few of them. So we found something like a hundred and more anomalous clouds in our data. And these are just the one that I believe, actually. And this is a column density map of the population, and this is the local standard of rest velocity, so the velocity of the velocity line of stuff. From this map, you can see that many of the clouds have, are quite faint. We are talking about column density of uh, 10 to the 18, 10 to the 19 uh, atoms per centimeter square. And I'm not sure if you can appreciate it, maybe not, but many of, many of them have also an head tail structure, which is suggestive of material which is blown away. You know? If you look at the velocity, uh, it's a kind of a mess. And you see no signature of rotation. If this, these things were rotating with the galaxy, you would see uh, a bunch of red stuff at negative, at low positive longitudes, and a bunch of blue stuff at negative longitudes. But there is no sign on there. So these clouds doesn't care about the rotation of the galaxy. Uh, yeah. This is not the rotation velocity, this is the line of sight velocity. To compare the rotation velocity with the It depends on the position of yeah. the. Uh, it changes a lot. Because. <laughs> so, what is the criteria? I use the model. Yeah. I use the model, I mentioned it before, yes. You can see the, the galaxy which is rotating normally and stuff that is completely missed. To have an idea of the scale, can you read it? 2.5k. Yes, and I want to point out that this population is completely unique from the galactic center. In the sense that if you look at any other position in the galaxy at this latitude, you uh, will never see something like that. You will, you will see high velocity clouds, but they do not differ so much from the rotation. And you cannot see never, for example, two clouds in the same position with velocities that differ like 500 kilometers. So, this population is unique from the galactic center. That's why we believe that it's associated with the process happening in the galactic center. So, we thought, okay, maybe this is the famous uh, cold gas in train uh, in a wind that we are seeing. And uh, if this is true, this is pretty cool because it means that each one of these clouds is just a test particle put inside the wind. And these are the only direct way that we have to study a wind. And it is possible just in the mid way. Yeah, that's the idea, exactly. 
if you if you assume that it's an outflow, that's the interpretation. That's the only way of interpreting for a process. Okay, let's just see a couple of uh, distribution properties of this uh, uh, population. So this is the line of sight velocity. This is the uh, fine broadening of velocity dispersion, if you prefer. Radii and uh, column density. So green is the new survey compared to the old one in green. So I would like you to notice, first of all, that even if our data goes to 650 kilometers per second, we do not detect anything with higher velocity than 350. So we hit the boundaries in velocity at least of the population. Uh, the whole around zero is not true, it's not uh, real, it's just because of this velocity, the galaxy contamination is too big and you cannot really detect anything. If you look at the velocity dispersion, uh, these are full, full width of, of maximum uh, between 5 and 30 kilometers per second, so velocity dispersion 8 to 10, um, which means uh, normal ISS. Let's say that you see that it's not much different. Uh, this class has radii between uh, of a few 10 parsecs, and they have a column density between 10 to the 18 and 10 to the 20. If you look at the mass distribution, it's pretty similar to this. It goes between uh, 10 solar masses up to a few thousand solar masses, with most clouds being between 100 and 1,000 solar masses. Now, the uh, very disappointing thing is that we did not see any correlation between these properties and uh, uh, galactic latitude, which is a proxy for the ice on the galactic plane. And this is bad because if these things are for real and trained, we might expect that they are going uh, uh, to be evaporated by the hot wind, and these properties should change with, uh, with the distance from the galactic center. However, it's also true that, uh, that uh, we are probing a, a not much to train quite more, just five degrees, so maybe we do not see for this reason why in UV, for example, they can see it. Okay, so we have this beautiful population, we have to do something with that. So we try to do the dumbest thing possible, uh, which is modeling uh, the kinematic of the population in terms of an expanding outflow uh, from the galactic center. So if you look at this very artistic cartoon, this is the galactic center, this is the sun, the sun is rotating around the galactic center, and we are observing a cloud at a given position, and this cloud is given a velocity, which is purely radial. And the system can be easily mapped into the observed uh, Longitude, latitude, and VSR, this is high school trigonometry. And you end up with an expression for the velocity, which looks like this one, where the first two terms are the projection of velocity along the line of sight, and this is the correction for the galactic position. Okay, so the, in the simple case, uh, the model is defined by just two parameters the wind velocity, that we assume to be constant, for simplicity again, and then the opening angle that basically tells you where a cloud is allowed. And we fit uh, different winds with different velocities and with different opening angles. We compare them to the data. So this is uh, the way a model looks like. It's made up by a bunch of particles. Each particle is moving with a radial velocity, but uh, these are color coded by the observed velocity from the sun. So uh, you see something like that, and the cone represents the volume that we uh, are uh, serving with, the, with these observations. And uh, <coughs> And just, I also want to stress that our cone is full of particles, so it's, we do not confine the particles in any, uh, not on the edges or anywhere. Okay, so uh, the problem with this kind of modeling is that uh, they are completely degenerate. First of all, because if you have a wind that at a given position, with a given velocity, can reproduce your cloud, this means that any wind with higher velocity will also reproduce this cloud, basically because along that one line of sight you have many clouds, and uh, all these projects with the different components. And uh, so it is something to keep in mind, and uh, that's why for comparing it with the data we decided to try to understand which model produces, reproduces the bulk of our population without producing also very aggressive clouds that we do not observe in the real sense. And during this comparison, we realized that the best wind velocities are between 300 and 400 kilometers per second, which are quite lower than the one uh, find, found in uh, UV absorption studies. But I also want to point out that we use a different uh, opening angle. So we constrain, let's say, the opening angle by requiring to reproduce also the clouds that are very low, 
latitude. So we do not assume it. We just see which which one is the cloud, the low with lower latitude that we have to reproduce, and if it's 140 degrees. And if you assume a narrower opening angle, then you will need higher velocity of the winds because the project the, the velocity components project less along the line of sight. And this is the main reason why in UV you find a higher velocity. Yes. So what you say is The wind velocity is the, yeah, the radial velocity, sorry, of all each particle. So it's not like the, the, the No, no, there, there is no acceleration or acceleration. It's all constant. Okay, so, uh, yeah, just to keep, you, keep in mind so that these models need to be taken with some sort of grain of salt. Right? So these are just a couple of comparisons of uh, data and observations. So this is, for example, a wind with velocity 280 km per second and opening angle 100 degrees. And so these are velocity against uh, longitude and latitude. That points are the clouds, and the colored regions are the regions allowed by uh, the model. And as you can see, with this kind of parameters, we do not fit the of the population. So this is not a good model. So if you get something with higher velocity and higher, uh, velo uh, higher um, opening angle, you see that you can reproduce basically all the population but one cloud, and you not, do not produce also very high velocity clouds that are not in the sample. So this is actually what we consider our best model with velocity 330 kilometers. Okay, so once you have your uh, your model and you are confident that it makes sense, you can actually calculate a few parameters of the wind. For example, you can get the total mass inside uh, this feature, which is about a million solar masses. And given that you have the velocity and the distance from, from the galactic center, you can say you can calculate the lifetime, which is a few million years with the oldest one being 10 million years. So, as we heard in the, in the, in the last days, uh, this is quite challenging for, because these things should evaporate in shorter time scales. We calculate the, the mass loading rate, 0.1 solar masses per year, which is very similar to the star formation in CMZ, and which means also that the CMZ needs continuous gas accretion to continue to form stars, and we calculate also the wind kinetic power necessary to uh, Accelerate this cloud, which is a few uh, 10 to 39 elements per second. This kind of energy can be supplied by uh, the galactic center uh, with these kind of transformations. Okay? Are you also uh, for the uh, for solid energy that the No. So yes, all these features seem to be consistent uh, with the idea that this cloud really represents material strain in a wind, and this wind could be uh, driven by the uh, star formation in the center of the world of the uh, Okay, so this is all very nice. And, uh, however, we are just using one of the information that we have in our data, which is the velocity along the line of sight. It's kind of a bummer because we have other information. We have uh, velocity version, we have problem densities. So what we are trying to do now is to uh, do something that is more sophisticated. So we are trying to do simulation, either simulation of the whole process of driving the wind in the, in the Milky Way. And I should stress that this is just work in progress. And uh, I mean, I, I don't have any results. I just want to show you some nice movies. And this is made in collaboration with Michel Milot and Mark Brown. And I should also say that uh, do something completely different from other uh, simulation of winds, we decided to simulate everything in a completely self-consistent way. So we simulate the whole process of gas accretion uh, towards the center, the formation of the central molecular zone, the star formation, feedback, and the outflow. And basically we put nothing by it. We just give the potential, the bar potential of the gas. So this is a low resolution uh, simulation, a test simulation. Uh, the, test particle is something like uh, 1,000 solar masses, while we will be running simulation of 10 uh, solar masses. Anyway, so we, we just put gas in, uh, in the potential of the Milky Way, and as you can see, uh, quickly the gas starts to move along uh, these dust lanes and inflow uh, towards the center and forms this nice, beautiful, dense ring of gas, and this is basically the central molecular zone. 
And once we have reached the, the uh, equilibrium status, we can turn on all the physics, all the formation, cooling, uh, feedback, and everything you can think. And this is what happens when you do that. Basically, you blow up completely the central molecular zone, you drive winds in the galactic center, you evacuate a lot of stuff, and but after a while you see that the gas starts again to infall uh, towards the center, and the subformation starts again, and you also start to see little cloudlets somewhere, like, yes, outflowing, and we have a bunch of foam gas in a, a higher line. This is what we want to study. We want to take all these gas and compare it to nephrolytic and then also maybe to do absorption like that. Sorry? Uh, I'm not sure it should be something like uh, 10 to the 5, but it is very low resolution. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, the pudding is made with a software which is called Dracul, which is similar to Cloudy, and goes down to 10 and okay. It goes down to 10. But it is all work in progress, it's just uh, an idea I, I wanted to show you. So yes, just coming to the conclusion, uh, I hope I convinced you that H1 emission is not completely useless, it creates the outflows, and actually with this, this survey we detected a lot of these clouds with very strange kinematics, and uh, we think that it might be gas moving with a radial velocity between 300 and 400 kilometers per second, if you assume this kind of uh, opening angle. Uh, for the future, one thing that we would like to do is to investigate the association with the Fermi bubble in the sense that now we are on very low latitude and basically all these clouds are inside the Fermi bubble. So we cannot say for sure that they are uh, the same phenomenon. I mean, they are made by the same phenomenon. So what we would like to do is just to go higher latitude and observe on off the Fermi bubble and see if there is any difference in the population between certain side and other side. Then we are also running a HD simulation, as you have seen. And finally, we are also following up a few of these clouds with a very high resolution interferometric observation because we would like to see if uh, in these clouds we see any feature that uh, is shown in a simulation of a single cloud and train uh, in a week. And spoiler alert, there is no sign of what you see in the Just completely crazy, crazy. Uh, yeah, that's all I've got, so thank you very much. Can I ask a quick question? Um, are you going to also look for stars on the site so that you can get the distance? Maybe the distance range? I think I checked very briefly there was no stars because these things are very small. They don't cover much. So, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, nice to see that they passed with your simulations. So, I don't know what I'm show is the snow. We also see some kind of uh, clouds that are being taken by the wind, but, but those seem to be like some kind of transient coming in and going, coming in and going. So, yeah. yeah, it's just good to see that sign sometimes coming up. Yeah, just, just a few, but, but they seem very low resolution. But one thing is that you really don't know the view that you don't you know the distance with the clouds go left to the surface of the sun. You do not know it. If you assume a model like this one, this tells you also this uh, because a model implies that there are thousands of these positions, but in the model depends. Um, I we see a lot of um, dense gas in jet produced radio knobs in high redshift radio galaxies. And the um, very um, prominent observation signature of these things is. That the, uh, if you take the hollow ensemble of clouds, you can't resolve it, and I the pulse, uh, you get a velocity width that's comparable to the cloud speed drifting outwards through the radio. And I was just under the impression, looking at your pictures, that if I take the whole clouds, the ensemble would produce a synthetic emission noise, that it would have. The velocity width of a couple of hundred kilometers, is that right? No, because we were between minus 300 and plus 300. So it would be something like 200 or 300? Yeah, 300 probably. 300. So it would be, again, be the same, the same as the high velocity you infer? Yeah. So it would be the same thing. Okay. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah.
So you saw this uh, size distribution of the clouds. Uh, how do you get that? Actually, do you have uh, independent distance? Uh, from distance the comes from the from the model. So the model, if you have a given velocity of the wind and you want to produce a given cloud, that cloud must be in a well, well defined position inside the wind. So you just take this distance and calculate. But this doesn't change much. I mean, it seems to just assume that they are all at the dark center in that place in this solution. And so I have a limited question. I noticed that between the ATCA uh, result and the GBT one, in terms of the column density distribution, you are closing the lower end of your yeah. column density. But are you already like too far from the GBT sensitivity, or do you expect even more mass on the cold phase? If, you know, on that phase, you will go deeper with the GBT. <laughs> yeah, I think the distribution will go if you go to lower Try um, a simple model and um, just putting all of the clouds in, in the surface of the cloud. In the edge, you mean? In the edge, you mean? Sorry. There are too many with too many velocities. So, you said that having those clouds sit there for a couple million years is a challenge for theory, and I just wondered if you could expand on that a little bit, because, I mean, these are like neutral hydrogen, so they're quite dense and they're pretty big, so I'm not, it's not obvious to me that they shouldn't sit there for a long time. I mean, I think we did see simulation last Yeah, but those were really different like, simulations than what the situation that you're describing. You mean because your cloud is, for example, 10 to the 4? Yeah, I mean, it depends on the density contrast and the velocity contrast, and particularly on the cooling, and most of the cloud crushing simulations don't allow gas to cool down to neutral hydrogen temperatures and like those are all things that it's hard to accelerate that gas but it's not hard to have it sit there for a long time. Okay. I'm still not, maybe I missed your slide but when you selected those uh, you must not use system model. Yes. You, you must have used the criteria. Yeah. Well, so well, basically when, when you see the gas in each one you know, the loss of you know what you expect from just a model of rotation. So for example, this, all this stuff inside here, this is gas which is located in the galaxy. This is the galaxy, it's as you expect it to be. These clouds, you don't expect to see. These are all around the velocity clouds, and that position there should be nothing. So the gas is outside of that. Yes. That is there okay. So I guess it goes back to the experiment of the if you go, if you look at a random direction, do the same experiment. For what sort of distribution of velocity? Yeah. Ah, okay. Yes. If you look at uh, any given any other position in the galaxy, what you see, you can see some clouds so from the. Uh, yes, but this is very low light. Right. So, yeah. so when you see uh, clouds that are not in perfect rotation, you see the deviation of the velocity of a few of you and kilometers per second. So basically, you need to see a cloud from the beginning. Okay, so the difference in the what you expect and what is for real is very low because these are clouds blown up by star formation. They have angular momentum and they keep the angular momentum. And while these clouds are completely crazy, they are not consistent with anything. I'm still not clear. I mean, where, where is your line? So these are anomalous and these are not. Is it the green line? Uh, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Yeah, it's, that's what I'm trying to find out. It's, first of all, there is a first cut, which is the model, and then there is a, a second cut, which is just we want these clouds to be separated spatially and spectrally from the galactic image. So they must be completely separated. They cannot join them. must be a velocity threshold. So that you should. Yeah, almost all, all of them have the last deviation velocity of more than 50 kilometers per second from the location. This is not in most, it's just in the yeah. The only phrase that clouds have to one and a half to the last one. Yes. Uh, however, the more you go higher, the more tricky it becomes because you start to see also normal atmosphere clouds. So, what I just said, the information is unique, is not true. You start to encounter normal high-velocity clouds, and it becomes very difficult to say if they are just really low high But yes, we are planning to go a little bit higher and uh, probe the, the edge of the family. 
and we can't do that. that we try to look for the chaos and damage to all our real-life society. So we only found one way to do it. The rest were all at the same time. Was it a low latitude? Uh, actually, not very. That was there is one of them that we want to do. The S456 does not have it. I have not had it. Okay, well, thank you very much.